And we are live. Hi, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to A Branch of Florals. I'm a Shaxi, and um, this is a weekly interview series where I interview members of the Order of the Laurel in the SCA. And uh, tonight, my guest is Cate God, Catedratico <laughs> Gregorio Cristobales de la Vega. I knew I was going to mess that up. I'm so sorry. Um, who is a combat laurel, which is kind of a rare breed. Um, so, uh, welcome. <laughs> um, tell me about your title. So, uh, Catedratico, it, uh, it's a Spanish title. It basically translates as professor. Uh, the previously I was using maestro, um, which is uh, a little more um, common within a uh, traditional fencing usage, but um, there was a there was some conversation a while back on uh, the circle forum uh, with regard to um, some people having discomfort with uh, the title of uh, variants of of master and mistress, yeah. and it, uh, I, I decided that that was a good time for me to uh, re-examine what titles I was using. And as I tend to not be that big on the kind of the hierarchical concept mm -hmm. uh, within, um, you know, a peerage and, and that I felt that um, an equivalent to professor was something I was more comfortable with. Yeah, I love and, that. And something, and if, if that's also something that helps other people be more comfortable with me, then it seemed like a kind of a no brainer. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Plus, I... plus it has the added fun of being difficult to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, names are, are hard. <laughs> And when there's the extra pressure of being live, I never get it right. So, uh, yeah, good times. So um, I usually start off by asking what your SCA origin story is, how you found the SCA, and what made you fall in love with it. So the SCA was something that I had started kind of, I was in, in high school, I was doing um, a fair amount of theater and had started hearing, uh, you know, whispers and hints and allegations of uh, this place where you could, you know, dress up funny and stab each other with swords. And so uh, after I graduated high school, went down to Southern Oregon University, which is uh, down in what at the time was the Shire of Glendufin, now the Barony of Glendufin, uh, made it a point to look up the SCA down there and got involved with uh, the SCA College Club, and uh, you know, met friends, stabbed them in the face, had fun. Were you? Um, did you uh, do uh, college fencing before you started the SCA? Not formally. Um, I did. There was there were some folks um, actually. So I grew up up here in this area. And there were a few folks who uh, got together and kind of did some, you know, backyard foil type of stuff. Uh, so I did a very, very tiny bit of that. Uh, I think anybody with a, a formal background in, in modern fencing would probably, you know, do somewhere in between cringing and screaming if they saw what we've been doing. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So did you, um, before you hit college, did you have a love of, of history and of? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd already been studying history. I'd already been studying um, historical weapons and armor, things like that. I'd also been doing, you know, um, with theater, with theater involvement, I already tended to gravitate toward roles that you know, gave me the opportunity to do stage combat and and things like that. So it was all kind of there. And then growing up as an oddly proportioned human being, uh, I uh, also 
started learning to sew fairly early as well. Interesting. Are you super tall? Yeah, I'm I'm uh, six foot four. Okay. And um, exactly half of that is inseam. So um, already not standard proportions there. <laughs> and um, when I graduated high school, I think I might have been up to 150 pounds if it was a particularly heavy part of the day. Wow, wow. So, so you were long, yeah. long and lean. Yeah, I had to run around in the shower to get wet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's really interesting. Um, a lot of, uh, I'm gonna, my terminology regarding kind of fighting you do is bad. So please correct me as we go. I'm gonna say fencing. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people who do fencing in the SCA have kind of that longer leg, shorter body, body type. And a lot mm -hmm. of heavy fighters have the shorter leg, longer body type. I don't know if you noticed that at all. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a thing. <laughs> it is. As a yeah. seamstress, it's like, this is really interesting how this splits up. Well, so, I mean, one, one of the things that tends to favor long lean fighters in a rapier context is with the fact that we don't do full power cuts and um, everything tends to be a lot more thrust oriented, which means that being able to hit the other person from really, really far away uh, has a lot more benefit than necessarily being able to reach around their shield and you know, hit them with a wrap shot. Right, right. right? And so with, with heavy combat, there's a lot of working around the shield and things like that, which tends to favor long arms. And, you know, rapier field, there's, there tends to be a lot of lunges, which tend to favor long legs. Legs, yeah. Right. That makes sense, yeah. Just uh, the body mechanics of it is fascinating to me. Yeah. Well, and that mostly speaks to what advantages are easier to teach and grasp. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, um, sorry, I got distracted about that. Not a problem. <laughs> um, so you got into the college uh, mm -hmm. group and um, did you get into costuming too or, or how did you... How, how, how were you outfitted? Who, who helped you with your clothing? Who helped you with your equipment? Yeah, so that was me. Um, <laughs> I actually did my, my work study at Southern Oregon. Well, it was, it was Southern Oregon State College at the time. Uh, I was there during that transition from state college to university. And uh, I was actually paying for my books and stuff like that through a work study in the theater department costume shop. Oh, awesome. So... I'd been spending, I'd, I'd been learning to sew leading up to that and got on campus, saw a posting for an opening there and basically just took a bunch of my costume stuff, put it in a garment bag and walked down there and handed them my garment bag as my resume. Nice. <laughs> that would be like a total dream job for me. That sounds like a lot of fun. It was, it was a really interesting experience. Um, I learned a lot there and I learned Honestly, I, th I think it's, it's one of those experiences that, that more guys could benefit from um, because I was the only guy working in that, in that costume shop. And um, so aside from being, you know, getting the experience of, of being in the gender minority and um, I, I, this was this was mid 90s right and so i already had the experience of of you know getting in line at the cutting counter at the at the fabric store <laughs> and uh having the cutter uh look past my shoulder to try to find the person that i was holding fabric for nice. right and so but getting that experience of having people assume that i didn't know what i was doing because i was a guy right yeah um that really shifted some things in my perspective um, 
gave me a little bit of an idea of, of what that feels like to have that happen. Because as a woman, it happens a lot <laughs> in a lot of, <laughs> in a lot of situations. And it's rare to have, to be in a situation for like that. For a guy. Yeah. I, I mean, to this day, like I said, I, I learned a lot in that job. I, I feel like that was probably the most valuable thing I learned in that job um, was, was, like I said, what, what it felt like and what that experience was of being judged for, for my gender instead of my abilities. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. I think that's, that's a really good experience. <laughs> so um, eventually you came back up to this area mm -hmm. and um, what was that transition like for you in, inside the SCA? Well, so it was it was really kind of interesting because um, being down in being down in in Glendupin at the time, there was pretty much a firewall between the college club and the Shire, right? And so um, I had been playing for about four years when I moved up to Portland and had, um, you know, in spite of being really very active while I was down there, um, didn't have an AOA, didn't have, right, any of the awards. And then, of course, moving up here, everybody goes, oh, you've been playing for four years. Well, clearly, you've already got this, 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 this. So have fun, keep playing, right? <laughs> But um, so that that was an interesting part of the dynamic that, that went on. Um, it was nice being moving into an area where there were a lot of people and a lot of different groups because it made it uh, in a lot of ways, it made it a little easier to integrate. Right. Right. And very quickly got involved at the Bronial level, mostly in Three Mountains at the time. And yeah, it was a, it was a, a radically different experience up here than it had been down South. Okay. Yeah. Um, just the fact that you were able to kind of connect with the main branch is kind of a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, did you have another name before you had the name Gregorio? I did. Yeah. Um, so, so back when I started out down in the summits, I was Gregor the Mad. Uh, that was one of those when I, when I first started playing, and again, part of this comes down to that whole firewalled thing. Uh, I mean, we, we had, we had a lot of folks from the Shire who were coming to the college club practice, but we didn't get a lot of the Hey, you're a newcomer. This is how you SCA type of stuff. Right. And so I'd been coming to I'd been going to practices for months before um, the the first event that I went to down there. And we're literally at the event or at the prep for the event. We're getting ready to head over. And one of the people there goes, Oh, I forgot to ask, uh, what's your persona name? And I'm like, my, my what now? <laughs> what, what is this thing you're talking about? <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, I had, uh, um, I, I'd recently been rereading Kafka and uh, um, had no idea what focus I wanted my, um, my persona to have, but I was like, oh, okay, well, Gregor the Mad. Okay, done. <laughs> Here we go. We're named. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, were there was there a, a pretty active rapier group down there? It sounds like you had people to fight. Yeah, I mean, not when I started. Uh, when I started, there was no rapier program. Okay. Um, I actually started doing heavy first and uh, started working through some of that. And, you know, we were digging through rule books and things like that. And like, hey, this rapier thing sounds like fun. And there were some folks down there who had some expired Marshall's warrants. 
And so we kind of did some unofficial stuff and we sort of, you know, muddled around and made it up as we went along. And then um, because we didn't really have much in the way of, you know, a broad range of experience to help guide us, we started looking in other directions. And, um, you know, fortunately, we actually stumbled onto some um, historical rapier texts at the college library at Southern Oregon University. Wow. wow. So that totally set your trajectory. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I've, you know, always been a little bit of a research nut. So, you know, that was going to happen. <laughs> right, right. Awesome. That's really cool. Um, that's super cool. So how many people do you think were, were fighting right here by the time you left? Um, we had, let's see, we had a core of about, um, maybe half a dozen fighters with probably, um, you know, peaks of up to about 15 or 20 fighters. And then, um, it was in a lot of ways, it was easier for us to head down to West Kingdom to play down there than it was to head up into, uh, you know, in, into Ontario proper. Yeah. And so um, Kingdom of the West had gone through a period where rapier had been outlawed yep, I remember. down there. Yeah. And so the group of us that was, that was working in um, Glen Dufin ended up doing uh, a lot of work with uh, authorizations and things like that for the West Kingdom fighters as they worked to rebuild uh, their program down there. Um, in fact, I've, I hold rank in the, the West Kingdom Oil Guild of Defense uh, partially as a result of that. Very cool. I didn't know they had a Guild of Defense. Yeah, yeah. So that was when they, when they reinstituted uh, rapier combat, it was done exclusively through the guild structure. Wow. And okay. that lasted for a few years and everything was just horribly overdone. They basically took everybody else's safety regs and doubled them. Uh, <laughs> so it was, it was interesting times. Um, being really, really careful. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, one of the, one of the charges that had been levied at rapier fighting was that it was, um, it was extremely dangerous, which there really wasn't any data to support, but also nobody stepped up to really refute it properly. Right. So, um, yeah, worked, worked with that. And then after a few years, they ended up breaking off the, uh, the marshalate from the guild structure and the guild now just kind of exists as um, sort of a, a separate appendage within the rapier community down there. And do we have a guild in on tier? Uh, not, not presently. Okay. No, there was there was some work to get one started that would be just a a, a um, kind of a, a combat arts and sciences guild, and um, for a number of reasons, it just it never really took off. Partially just because it's a really complicated thing to do. Right, right. I um I interviewed a a, a woman from uh, Drakenwald. Mm -hmm. A couple weekends ago who does um uh, a type of fighting that is not heavy fighting <laughs> i can't remember what it's called um but they have a very um robust guild system there that i thought was really fascinating and i realized i'd never heard of that here and and but but admittedly i'm super disconnected from mm -hmm. the rapier community so um I, it's why i'm asking because it's it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, like, like with any guild uh, with, or with any topic, um, a guild structure can either, it, it can run the gamut from being very helpful and useful to being um, very restrictive and off-putting. Right. Right, and a lot of it really depends on how it's structured how it's administered and how it integrates with the rest of the community. And Ontier has always sort of had a very robust rapier community. Yeah, for the 
uh, for the time that I've been playing, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, when I came in in the mid nineties, <laughs> yeah, there were um, there were two laurels in the group that I kind of joined in that were also rapier fighters. I'm not sure if they were combat laurels or not. Mm -hmm. um, I think Artemis was a costume laurel, maybe. Mm -hmm. That's and my that, understanding. Huh? That's my understanding, yeah. And um, Albert is the other one. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't remember what his was. I don't remember offhand what, what his laurel was, was in. I don't think it was combat. I should ask him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so i i guess I, I what i my point with bringing that up is that i sort of started the sca with with the understanding that um the rapier community was completely valid and had mm -hmm. peers and was an intricate part of the rest of the kingdom mm -hmm. um and then you know you and baltazar and i think we have one other combat laurel well my my laurel uh dormouse was was also um for military science and, and military combat science. okay and mm -hmm. i think we have one more to, anyway we have a, a handful but it's not it's not common across the known world no i think there's i don't know maybe a dozen of us mm -hmm. yeah so it's um <clears throat> when the um talk of having another peerage come forth with the master of defense mm -hmm. one of my thought processes was but we already have i mean they we cover that in the laurel and mm -hmm. i've come to understand that my thinking is not correct with that that it's not the same yeah i mean there's there there's definitely at least um room for different ways of looking at that, right? Um, so I, I know one of the arguments that came up with um, with regard to arguing against adding a rapier peerage uh, was was the, but we can do that with the laurel. Another one was, but isn't that what knights are for? Uh, yeah. Right. Um, but part of it comes down to the uh, to the fact that when you are looking at a combat peerage um i think it's fair to say that the kind of the 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 first condition of that is the ability to play the combat game well right and there's a distinction between um, historical fencing as uh, historical fencing within its history context and historical fencing within its modern competitive context. And I'm, I'm, when I say modern competitive context, I'm actually referring to the combat game that we play in the SCA or the combat games, right? And you don't necessarily have to be even interested in the historical context in order to be good at the game, right? Right. And so we have, we have knights who don't necessarily um focus on the historical context of heavy armored combat right right we have members of the order of defense who do not necessarily focus on um the historical context of a rapier fight right they're nonetheless good solid fighters who you know are going to give you trouble if you want to try and stab them in the face Right. <laughs> right. And, and, our leader and, and who are and who are making very meaningful contributions to their community. Yes. And so I think the argument that you get to there is that if you're going to try to say, well, peerage worthy fencers should be 
getting put into the into the shift well then that requires the shift to take the action to make that happen and that as i'm not aware of any instance where that's ever happened no <laughs> right and if you're going to say that well they belong in the order of the laurel then you've got one of two cases to make the cases are either that the only peerage worthy rapier fighters are the ones who are focused on the historical context over the game context right or you're making the art or you're going to try to sell what in my mind is an even more difficult argument which is that the order of the laurel is concerned first and foremost with the historical context well except for in this one little carve out right right um and so i think a big part of creating the order of defense was about creating a path to um a a peerage that is seen as legitimate that doesn't require fundamental alterations to any of the existing peerages in order to work, right? Um, you don't have to have somebody who was a laurel with an asterisk or <laughs> a knight with an asterisk, right? right? right. Um, or even a pelican with an asterisk because there, there's a fair amount of, of rapier pelicans as well for service within the rapier community, right? Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thank you for um, spelling it out that way. It's a, that was a really, really good description and delineation of the different things. Yeah, and I, I'm really trying to trying not to speak out of turn here since I am not a member of the Order of Defense, but um, but I am a member of the Order of the White Scarf, and we were a pulling order as well. Yeah. Um, so. And, and I'm familiar with the arguments that were being made. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and I knew that you would be, which is why I asked the question. Yeah. Um, and I miss white scarves. So well, I we're, well, so so the white scarves are still white scarves. We're just not making any more of them. Right. right. <laughs> At least not in this kingdom. There are some of the kingdoms who, uh, for example, on Stiora, where the where the order of the white scarf originated um is still making white scarves interesting interesting i feel like that's a whole big can of worms maybe yeah there excuse me there was there was there were a lot of feelings about whether or not the order should stay open right and um I think there was concern. One of the things that was fairly unique within this kingdom, and this was one of the things that was, um, went back and forth between encouraging and frustrating <laughs> uh, before the order of defense was created was that we had a lot of, or a, a, a number of, um, crowns who would tell us, look, you're a, pro you're a polling order. You are the highest order for what you do. That essentially makes you equivalent to a peerage. And that's what you need to, that's how you need to carry yourselves. Yeah. Right. And, and, and from the outside, that's how I always looked at it. And, and that was a lot of how, that was how a lot of us chose to carry ourselves. Right. Um, then at the same time, we would then get instances where uh, the word from the crown would be, look, you're a grant level order. Don't get above yourself. <laughs> right. Don't get cocky uh, now. <laughs> but but so so there was always a little bit of that. OK, where exactly do we stand with this next set? <laughs> yeah, And that's but, that's horrible. Yeah. But um, what it did create, I think a lot of us chose to basically say, okay, we are going to always act as though the white scarf is, you know, a, a, a peerage equivalent thing in terms of comportment and PLQs and, and all of that. And 
So part of the concern that came up with uh, with the, the formation of the order of defense was that we didn't want to have a line in the sand where if you were made a white scarf before this date, you were a real white scarf. And if you were made after this date, you were some kind of weird knockoff cheap seat no white scarf. Mm, that makes sense. Right. And it was it was one of those things where where the the argument that was expressed was we we again we don't want to start applying a, an asterisk to anybody's title right on this right uh, we don't want the white scarves and the white scarves but well not really right right <laughs> it, it, uh, how do you make it clean you know how do yeah. you make it yeah that's really tough yeah so that helps <laughs> Yeah, so so the decision that the, the that the crowns at the time came to was that the best way to make that was to just close the order and not make more white scarves. And is there a grant level a, a new grant level award to replace that or to we don't have one, do we? No, not not that not that is rapier specific. There is, um, there is a general grant level combat award within the kingdom. I am is that. Uh, I should know that too. That and table I, gauntlet. Maybe <laughs> there's been so many added in the past ten years that I can't remember them all. You're gonna look it up, aren't you? Oh yeah, <laughs> you're awesome. <laughs> My second laptop died, so I can't, I can't multitask like that. Anymore. Well, I've got these. Oh yeah, nailed it. <laughs> Good job. Yeah, so, so yeah, there's, there's the Order of the Sable Gauntlet and um, we have, since the closing of the Order of the White Scarf, we have seen rapier fighters recognized with the sable gauntlet. The gauntlet. Okay, good. Yeah. good. I wonder if uh, if uh, archery folks get recognized with that too or if there's a different so the the thing. archery community still has um, uh, the goose gray goose yeah order the gray goose shaft. Yeah. My name server crashed there for a second. <laughs> you know it happens all the time. I think the pandemic makes it worse. Um that's right they do i should yeah. i should have known that um yeah, yeah. And, and the oggs is also a they're a, pol a grant level polling order right right so they they could uh potentially go through the same kind of upheaval that <laughs> if there's if there becomes another omnibus or archery peerage or whatever ends up happening yeah we could make that that whole thing happen again <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yep. good times. Uh, well, okay, we won't get too distracted with that. So anyway, <laughs> um, we'll circle back to you moving up here. Mm -hmm. And um, you ended up hooking up with Dormouse. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was actually, it's been really interesting going back over my SCA timeline and, and looking at, at uh, where and when and how things happened. Um, so I, I moved up here uh, beginning of 2000. And the end of 2000 to um, in through t uh, 2001, there was just so much that happened. <laughs> uh, it was all a bit crazy. Wow. Uh, because in two, so in 2000, I decided, um, so uh, Their Excellencies Three Mountains, uh, uh, Gwilym and Elizabeth had put out the call for sergeantry candidates. And so this was at, if I've got my, if, if, if I'm remembering correctly, this was at like Salwyn in uh or whatever the the equivalent event was right. uh in uh 2000 okay. 
And so I sat down with Her Excellency and we, we talked through it and went, okay, I'm going to do this. Awesome. And so I show up at, um, I show up at Three Mountains Yule, which was the deadline for turning in letters for, for that year's trials. And I show up um, in full classic overachiever mode uh, with uh, my letter of intent written in, uh, written in triplicate. And being that, you know, as a Spaniard in a, uh, in an English court, <laughs> I was a foreigner. So triplicate meant once in, once in my language, once in the language of the court and once in the language of the church. Wow. Right. So, so I, I, I give them three copies, one in English, one in Spanish, one in Latin. <laughs> Had some help with that. <laughs> And, you know, did, did the whole thing of researching, a, you know, the, a proper 16th century Spanish calligraphy hand and, you know, practically broke my fingers getting that to work <laughs> and turned that in and started down the sergeantry uh, path. That same event, um, I had shown up and there was there was rapier fighting at that event. And I something was going on with my sinuses. I wasn't feeling well and I knew that I was misjudging di distances. So I made the decision that I would to not fight at that event. Um well um Don Dormouse and uh Donya Bridget were there. And of course, Bridget is like, oh, I've got extra gear, I'll loan you some, get out and fight. I love her. And I'm like really polite, I'm, I'm trying to really, really politely decline and all of that. And and Dormouse calls me over, he's like, so why aren't you fighting? <laughs> and I walked through, I said, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not in control, I'm not in the level of control of my body that I wanna be, and I don't wanna risk hurting somebody. Yeah. And there was this, huh interesting <laughs> and so after the whole letter thing i come back we we had ended up sitting at, at the same table for dinner and uh he leans over he's like when court's over you and i need to have a chat uh. <laughs> like okay <laughs> and so we end up going out into the hall he's like so you want to be a cadet <laughs> So yeah, basically, so so I, I put in my letter of intent for Gallant and uh, started a conversation about becoming a cadet at the same event. In, in March, I took the red scarf. In, I think it was April, we had, at, at that point, the Gallant trials or the Sergeant Free trials were, were an event. Yeah, I remember. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, um, did sergeantry trials. We get done with that, and I get sworn in as a gallant. And of course, gallants uh, swear to the baroness. And uh, so, of course, you know, being a, a good little gallant, I ask her excellency, uh, "What would you like me to do next?" And she says, "Well, I've got a champions tournament next month." I want you to win it. Oh. <laughs> so June marked the start of my term as rapier champion for three mountains. Wow. <laughs> because you wow. do not say no to her excellency. <laughs> you were clearly very ready to level up. Yeah. And it was just like all of this right at once. And right in that same time was also when I got, um, as a tournament prize, actually one of my first untranslated uh, period fencing treatises. Oh, wow. Which, this one right here, which is a copy of uh, uh, Jacob Sutor. Right. Nice, uh, nice fracture there. 
and also in 2001 um i was doing some digging through a university library and happened to happened to cross an untranslated um Destreza text um that text and the german text actually became two of my first not entirely successful attempts at uh at translating from foreign languages that i didn't speak <laughs> <laughs> Before Google Translate was a thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I was a lot more successful at Sutor than I was at uh, Tamariz, which was the Spanish one. But I mean, it started out as, you know, um, I was back in college up here and writing mass transit and the whole way there and the whole way back. I had, you know, Sutor in one hand and uh, an English German translation dictionary in the other hand and a notepad on my leg and I'm making alphabetical translation lists <laughs> and just really learning it the hard way. <laughs> right. wow. wow. That's really impressive. That's a lot of dedication. Well, it's, it's one of those things when, when I started out doing his, doing fencing, we did not have much of anything in English. Um, so back in, so this would have been, this would have been 96. And at the time we basically, we were basically working from, you know, whatever table scraps we could get in uh, Edgar, uh, Edgerton Castle's uh, Schools and Masters of Defense uh, or Schools and Masters of Fencing, depending on which publisher you're looking at. Um, and a book uh, called Methods and Practice of Elizabethan Swordplay, which had, um, which had translated material from the three Elizabethan fencing masters. So, um, uh, Giacomo de Grassi, which was actually a text from closer to the middle of the 16th century, and it was a 16th century translation of an Italian treatise. Wow. Um, uh, Vincenzo Saviolo, which is, I, I'm going to make some people mad for saying this, but it is more of an advertisement for his fencing school than it is an actual treatise on how to fence. Oh, interesting. Okay. <laughs> and I mean, it basically describes two days of lessons and um, considerations for whether or not you ought to pick a fight with somebody. And they're mostly social considerations as opposed to practical ones. <laughs> And, but, oh, I mean, fascinating to yeah. get that. Uh, anyway, sorry. Well, and then and then the third one was uh, George Silver, who was a notorious xenophobe, who absolutely despised the Italianate methods of rapier fencing, yeah. and the rapier in general. Uh, he was he was a um he he was a teacher of the older english masters of defense type of school he he was using um a back sword so it's a more more specifically a cutting weapon a little heavier not quite as long um definitely not the same weapon that we tend to think of when we you know look out onto the rapier field Right. Um, that said, I know a lot of or a number of fencers who have um, adapted his work to that context. But most of what was in um, Methods and Practice was his first book, which had a lot less to do with how you ought to use a sword and a lot more to do with why the way everybody else used a sword was wrong. <laughs> hmm. So as you go through all of these texts and you get more 
methods and you see more different types of weapons and weapon styles used, does that kind of expand the modern fighting styles a little bit or is yeah that i mean kind of at the very least it 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 shifts the perspective on where um on where rapier fencing sits in the larger history of of historical fencing um, if you're looking at, um, well, if if you're looking at something like, um, you want to you want to go through your yeah let, let let me okay. let me pull up a couple of slides here, I think this will be a little easier. Um, so there's our uh, schools and masters of fencing and and. Um, methods and practice of Elizabethan swordplay that we were just talking about. Um, and uh, George Silver here with uh, with one of his one of his wards. And Saviolo. This and is so cool because it has costumes and everything. I mean, it's got the body positions and yeah, you have to be really careful with your takeaways from, okay. from that when you're interpreting these okay. uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, now the, the Italian sources and some of the, some of the, the later German sources are fairly anatomically reliable. But um, you know, if you if you've looked at art history, there's there's different movements that occur in illustration, right? Uh -huh. And so, in some cases, you have illustrations that really are intended to be representative of what is of the anatomy of what is going on. Okay. But in others. Um, like so, some of the early Italian stuff, the uh, when you're talking about like the the 15th century Italian and 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 early 16th century Italian stuff, some of those illustrations are more, or at least arguably, more intended to imply a kind of movement of the body as opposed to the shape that the body is in at that moment. Right, so you might have leg, you might have one leg that's drawn longer than the other to show that it is being extended. <laughs> right. So, so uh, making, making your body look like it does in the picture is maybe not going to be a viable fighting technique. <laughs> yeah. Um, added to that, the artists, or the the art was almost never done by the author. Oh, okay. And in fact, there's there's this fabulous piece. So the 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 primary book that I work from or that I center my practice around is um, Gerard Thibault's Academy of the Sword, um, which is a it was a treatise written in French but um, derived out of the uh, verdadera destreza tradition from Spain. And there's a beautiful moment in there where he just absolutely rips into the um, the engraver who did one of the plates because the engraver um, had the nerve to draw a accessory in the in the fat in the manner of fashion instead of in the manner that Thibaut himself was trying to describe. Uh, right. And so you see that there's that tension between between artists and um, authors. Right. And then to add to that even a step further, we know that at least in some prints, the art itself was not necessarily even created for that text. It was essentially 
the period equivalent of clip art. Oh, wow. Okay. And it was just, oh, that's close. And honestly, the the author may not have even seen the image until the book came out because it 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 might have been the editor that did it. Right. So we have to be really careful what we get out of pictures. That said, yeah, I love the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and and a, a treatise with with good and more or less reliable images is definitely a lot easier to work with than one that doesn't have any. Right. Which, so of course, you know, I chose to focus on the Distressa tradition, which has a lot of sources with few, if any, pictures. So speaking of Thibault, okay. this is one of the prints out of Gerard Thibault's Academy of the Sword. Um, what are they that, gauging range? What are they? Uh, well, so there's a whole bunch of stuff going on here. Um, Thibault was doing some really interesting things with attempting to explicitly show movement. And so what you see is um, in, in the, the plates on the front corner, you can see if you look down at the little ge geometric circles there, um, there's one labeled number four and one labeled number five. And you can see the shadows of the swords there on the floor. Okay. Right. And so that's showing the relationship between those weapons uh, as, as a function of silhouette onto the floor diagram. Wow. The floor diagram itself allows Tabo to tell you exactly where each foot is. Okay. And from there, he can describe balance and things like that. My, my husband uses a similar floor diagram when he does uh, pal practice that mm -hmm. is separated into quadrants. And yeah. That's interesting. And then by doing a series, so, so um, Tabo will show a series of actions with each step having a one of these circles with a pair of figures. So he'll start an action at um you know circle number one and then maybe it goes to two and three and four and five okay. but then he might restart at three and go to seven and eight as an alternate form and things like that so it creates this ability to essentially make a connect the dots pattern or like stop motion action but all just kind of artistically rendered into you know a, a big one image gigantic plate wow and keep in mind that the original of this um the original of this book is um a little i think it was a little over 20 inches tall wow i i got the chance to handle one that's at um, the Newberry co uh, collection in Chicago. And uh, yeah, the book is just absolutely gigantic. Wow. wow. That's really cool. So while Thibault himself focuses on single sword with no offhand weapons of any kind, and boy, does he have opinions about that and anything else you want to ask him. <laughs> uh, he does show the single sword being taken against uh, single sword, sword and dagger, sword and buckler, uh, two-handed sword, and he shows uh, he shows it being taken against his understanding of uh, some of the contemporary Italian fencing as well. Wow. So a lot of that spurred my looking into other weapon systems, other other systems, things like that, partially to try and understand to what extent he actually understood how those things worked. Mm, okay. And to what extent he was um, knocking down straw men. Right. And 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 then ultimately to what extent he want to take his word as gospel into your practice. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I have found that whether or not his whether or not his descriptions of what the other person are going to do are as accurate as we might like, mm -hmm. um, the solutions that he comes up with tend to be pretty effective. <laughs> awesome. And we know that he was also a very effective tournament fighter. And so, so my my research is all into a, um, a culture that has no written records, and so mm -hmm. that you have access to all of this, and that you can back up, you can you know that he's he was a, a good tournament fighter because you have other documentation of that. It's just so cool. Yeah, it's it's really. I feel really fortunate to have gotten into this at the time that I did. Um, being able to go from that perspective where we had, you know, maybe half a dozen sources in English if you really stretch it. Right. And if you're not too concerned with quality. <laughs> um, to where we are now, where um so earlier this year i was part of a really great um online lecture series just on the topic of distressa and between all of the material that's been translated and the work that people are doing uh to build some of that out that has had lectures almost every week from May until the end of last year. Oh, right. Are they and available after the fact? Yeah, yeah. There's uh, there's a YouTube channel for it. In fact, uh, the the person um, so that that lecture series is was being done by the Sacramento Sword School, which is run by uh, Puck Curtis and Eric Myers. Um, Puck is also a uh, white scarf from Osteora, originally oh. now living in the West Kingdom. Very cool. Well, will uh, you, when we're done, will you uh, dump a link into yeah. the comments so people can check that out? That yeah, I can do awesome. that. So, yeah. so that that whole 2001, uh, this was the event where I got my white scarf, me being a, you know, scrawny little guy. Uh, this here, this, this suit is also a uh, banana suit the first. So that's you in the yellow. That is me in the yellow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So this was. Uh, so that's that's me in the yellow. Um, in the blue. That's that's Don Dormouse. At, well, Don Dormouse at the time. Uh, later, uh, uh, Meister Dormouse. And then uh, my two cadet brothers at the time, uh, Tempest and Talon. Okay. And this was this was that event. And yeah, and, and my gigantic bucket top boots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we uh we we saw the sign and we all just kind of looked at each other and we're like, yeah, that picture needs yep. to happen. It's on. <laughs> <laughs> so, I referenced uh wow. Tampa Pharaoh earlier. Um this is uh this is this is one of the plates from uh Rodolfo Capoferro's Grand Simulacra. Um, so this was a really pivotal treatise in, in my progress. Um, this was after I had gotten, after I'd started working with Thibaut, after I had found a copy of um, uh, Tamaris uh, cartier Lutz, but before I had tried translating anything. And actually, it was um, the so I got a, I got a copy of the translation by um, uh, ESCA uh, Maestro Balthasar and uh, Baron Master Gwillem Appawain. Um, so um, uh, Jarek Swanger and William Wilson, mm -hmm. uh, they had done a, a translation and they had released it as a PDF, but it didn't have any images. So I found I got a hold of some of the images, but I only had them with the Italian text. Or I uh, actually sorry, I had the I had the images by themselves, 
I had a PDF of the Italian text and I had a PDF of the English without the images. And so I started going through and muddling my way through comparing the English to the Italian to figure out which image went with which what? block of text and reformatting that and then ended up sending a copy back to them and say, hey, you guys want one with pictures? <laughs> This is such a beautiful image. It, it really is. It, it, uh, you, can, you can really tell so much about what's going on with it. And this is, this Capoferro, if you're reading sources like uh, Castle, who, I mean, you have to keep in mind that, that his Schools and Masters of Fencing was the product of a 19-year-old Victorian kid. Wow, 19? Uh, yeah, 19. Oh, uh, and there is a lot wrong with it, but it is nonetheless, it is the, it is the history that all other histories of fencing have to answer to. That's if for no other reason than you, then um, if you've got just about any myth of, of historical um, European fencing, um, there's a really good chance it was documented in Castle as being absolute gospel truth. Um. <laughs> So this this guy on the on the right, the lunger, yes, is he, that front foot position normal to have it pointing out like that instead of towards your opponent? Um. So this is a so you've got a passing lunge, so normally that that foot that he's lunging off of mm -hmm. that would be his forward foot normally, but he's passed the other foot forward. In order to do that mechanically from the stance that he's in, he actually has to be moving off at an angle uh, that would have him passing in between our vantage point and figure D. So he's kind of, he, and that, that right leg is gonna come around and he's gonna move past. Yeah, so, so if you think about um, the, from a mechanics perspective, we generally want the hinge of the knee and the direction of the foot in the same line right. when that leg is bearing force because knees are hinges and right. they break like hinges. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think the way that I generally interpret this is not that, not that putting everything in exactly that line that it's shown in is a good idea, uh -huh. but that if you correct, if you kind of mentally correct the image to have him moving off to Fencer D's right side yes, and consider the foot to be in line with that movement. Then it makes sense. Then it makes sense and it's mechanically yeah. sound. Okay. And that's part of, I think, that interpretive work that we have to do when we look at images like this to say, well, maybe exactly as drawn isn't, isn't quite what we're going for here. Right, right. Right. Super cool stuff. Yeah, this is this is a a book. There's several editions of this book, and some of the later editions, uh, the the naked fighters have had uh, uh, fig leaves and things <laughs> put in place. <laughs> Someone has dropped uh, links into the Destreza uh, lecture series. Excellent. So with your first and second lecture. So yep. thank you, Ashley Rose. This is that uh, Cartier Lutz um, by Nicholas Tamaris. I'm actually just now circling back to translating this one. Oh, very cool. My, my, I now that I've now that I've actually done uh, some Spanish stuff cover to cover, I, I'm a lot more confident in my Spanish translation. And so I decided it's time to circle back to the starting ones and get those done. And Sutor, one of the fun things about Sutor, you were talking about multiple weapons earlier. Right. So here we have staff. Okay. We have um, rapiers here. We've got uh, these little things called disex. What are those? Are they like a double-handed weapon? No, it's single-handed. Uh, what's happening is he's he's got um, he's got the blade up, and he's then bracing the other hand up. Oh, okay. And so he's resting it on the forearm. It's one of the it's one of the hanging guards that's done with that particular weapon. Okay. 
Uh, by Sutor's time, this was arguably mostly a tournament weapon. Mm -hmm. um, and we have at least some documentation of these being in either wood or leather. And you basically, uh, you, you win by hitting the other guy in the head hard enough to draw blood. Yikes. They weren't terribly concerned with concussions at that point, apparently. I guess. Yeah. And then you've got long swords here. Wow. Right. Uh, the the German school that this is derived from tends to have the long sword as the focal weapon, and then the other weapons as kind of offshoots of that um, that central theory. Which does shift things around a little bit. Yeah. So, so this. <laughs> so so this is. Um, I I found I don't actually have a whole lot of pictures of my early years in the SCA. Uh, so this would be uh, 2007. Uh, we're lining up um, in preparation for my laurel ceremony at. Awesome. This particular image. Um, yeah, that morning I was sewing the last of those buttons in place. <laughs> is that Ula in front of you? Who is that? No, that's my lady. That, that oh, that's is uh, Gianna Visconti, uh, oh. who is currently our, uh, once again, um, running our uh, Embellishers Guild. Oh, cool. But yes, you get to see the side of her head there. <laughs> so I ended up really delving a lot into one of the more obscure or not so much obscure as tangential uh, German texts, a um, guy by the name of um, Paulus Hector Meyer or Mare depending on how you want to argue about the pronunciation. <laughs> he was really a documentarian and he was creating kind of an encyclopedia of Germanic fighting. And some of his more interesting speculative stuff included uh, uh, how to fight with hand sickles. Wow. Which is did he do his own illustrations or is this another? We think he probably did. Okay. Um, his book never actually went to print. We have three handwritten versions. Wow. And they're all slightly different. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, one of them is in German. One of them is in Latin. And one of them has both Latin and German. And the illustrations are at least stylistically different between all three of them. Huh. Interesting. This was actually where this treatise was actually where I really started delving very heavily into German translation because uh, some folks had done translations of the long sword work, but I was more interested in the other stuff. And so I started, um, and by, by this point, I was, also, um, I was also helping to run a uh, historical fencing school. And so I was teaching this, this stuff in classes. And so, um, I did translations of the sickle fighting, the dagger fighting, polax, a um, little bit of polax. <laughs> so, so just just to kind of place everything, was this before? Mm -hmm. Is this work that you were doing before you were Laurel? Or is this subsequent work? This was work that started around the time that I got Laurel, okay. and then continued very heavily after that. I, um, one of the things that I kind of want to want to be sure to demonstrate with these interviews is kind of mm -hmm. 
at what point the work that you're doing is laurel ready, right? Yeah. And so, and, and, and that's a hard thing for, I think, like, I remember what I was doing when I got Laurel, but mm-hmm. I don't know what they talked about. I don't know what, <laughs> which of the, cause I have like, I'm a splatter kind of person. I just do all kinds of stuff at once. And I don't know what, I don't know. Yeah, I, honestly, um, I wasn't a hundred percent clear when I got my Laurel, what exactly they were laureling me for. <laughs> Um, (laughs) it was, it was one of those things, um, and, and in fact, um, most people, I think, tend to assume I'm a costuming Laurel, and not that I am a fighting Laurel. Now, partially as a result of that, I've, I've really worked to make sure that my costuming is up to snuff, (laughs) right? I feel that like pain. I wasn't going to do that anyway, but um, and and so I mostly identify as a stabbing laurel. Right, right, and I, <laughs> I think I was a laurel. I was in on the discussions about you, and it was mm-hmm. both. Yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah. I actually at a certain point, I remember enough people trying to tell enough people who weren't laurels trying to tell me what I got my laurel for. <laughs> that I finally just went to some of the people who I knew for a fact were involved because, you know, one of them was my Wrangler. Right. <laughs> and I was like, okay, straight word, what was it? <laughs> they're like, no, you're a fighting laurel. <laughs> yeah. It's, they're like, yeah, we talked about the other stuff, but you're a fighting laurel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's, there's this breadth, breadth and depth mm-hmm. kind of, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for kind of ratio that you, that you have to kind of incorporate into every elevation decision. Yeah. So, well, and that, that thing of you want a person to be really good at a thing, but you want a person to be more than competent in more than one thing. (laughs) Exactly. Right. You, you, you don't want, you don't want a, a person to be just, completely one-dimensional right on there right because because it's uh you know part of the minimum requirements is that mm-hmm. you're you know an, kind of an example of the state yeah. culture so mm-hmm. gotta do more <laughs> yeah but at, at the time that that happened so i was teaching i was teaching a lot of classes with a focus on this is what's in the book this is what's in the rules this is what we can do from the book within the rules. This is what we absolutely can't. And this is what we can do if we do it this way instead of that way. And then also I was pretty heavily involved in, in pushing the idea of um, historic combat arts and sciences, which is a phrase that when I first started you know, shopping that around, I got a whole lot of, what? 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 <laughs> It's not a thing. You're making up words. It's totally a thing. <laughs> yeah. And so so I was doing a lot of classes, including a lot of classes on things that were, you know, this is this is what we find in documented history. We can't do any of it in what we do, but this is what we find. Uh, I remember one event where I taught a class on how the fundamentals of, um, you know, the core fundamentals of wrestling within the Lichtenauer tradition in Germany uh, translated between empty hand wrestling and armed wrestling with a variety of weapons. Wow. Right, as like a a two hour hands-on class at some big, you know, Ithra event or something. And so I was doing a lot of a lot of fencing classes through um, through Ithra, uh, through the Ithra time and through basically anywhere that they would give me space. Right. right. <laughs> and and since you couldn't do a lot of the period combat combat stuff in, within the SCA rules, is that sort of what led you to do a school outside of the SCA? 
Uh, partially. Yeah, I mean, so we could do within the, within SCA rules, we could do um, choreography and demonstration, but we couldn't do improvisation, right? right? If it was things like wrestling or, um, you know, things like that. So yeah, that was that was a big part of it was that I needed a space where I could um, pressure test what was, you know, what was being translated and work through some of that. Um, and yeah, so a so, um, couple of us got together, started up a school up here. Um, ran it from, there was actually quite a bit of overlap. That that started right about the same time that I got my Laurel. Um, and so I did that for uh, about 10 years. Wow. And unfortunately that also had kind of a negative impact on my ability to do SCA. I, I would, um, yeah, I would think so. Yeah, it's one of those things that when when you are running a professional enterprise and you have to keep the doors open and the lights on and um a lot of the events where we could get out and we could do demonstrations and things like that were conflicting with the the times that sca events were going on so for a while there um i was actually still holding championships and things like that until um, about 2010, right in there. Yeah. And then I dropped down to where I was probably only hitting uh, about four or five events a year. And which is still not nothing. No, it's, it's still not nothing, but, um, <laughs> but it sure felt like nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it was a lot of it, it was less a matter of I'm going to take the top, you know, five or six events out of the year. And those are the ones I'm going to hit. And it was more of a, well, there's five or six events that don't actively conflict with other places I have to be. So I guess those are the ones I'm going to. Yeah. And so I, I wasn't necessarily able to, you know, to get in and do a lot of fighting and, and things like that. And then because I was doing my fighting in a different way outside of the SCA, where we were working to entirely different calibrations and we were, you know, it was one of those things that if you've got the opportunity to step in and hip throw somebody, you just do it, right? Because we all knew that was going to be part of the game. Right, right. And we were all trained to take those, we, you know, we all trained to take those falls. Right. Right. Um, trying to transition back into SCA fighting from that and, and going back and forth is yeah so so I kind of stepped back from fighting for a while yeah um just out of a you know don't want to accidentally step in and hurt somebody <laughs> right no, it's <laughs> or just do something stupid right. right um and you know that that was good in that I got to connect with a lot of people. I got to really work with a lot of material. Um, and I got to to push a lot of things. But then um, right around um, so around 2016, I tried to make an effort to really get back to fairly active playing again. And um, just ended up having like one mishap after another <laughs> on the way there. I remember getting up to, I had the, the truck all packed. I was getting, I got up in the morning to head to Crown and there was like a big puddle of antifreeze under the truck. So I'm like, oh, well, man. I guess I'm spending the weekend rebuilding the radiator. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, and then I also got a chance to teach at a lot of really good events. Um, I've taught at uh, the Vancouver International Swordplay Symposium three different times. Um, taught at, um, you know, a, a number of other um, historical European martial arts events. And, you know, gotten to travel and meet some great people. That's and, super exciting. 
yeah, it's it's good stuff, and I, I still keep my uh, I still keep my toes in those waters. Um, and these days, not all of the reconstruction and translation that I'm doing fits neatly within SCA period. Right. Um, so, um, what one of the Destreza lectures that I did is on uh, 19th century Spanish saber. Not a whole lot of call for that in the SCA. No. <laughs> <laughs> But fighting is fighting. I mean, you know, my uh, my husband watches a lot of Muay Thai videos, which is not, you know, yeah. yeah. But it's body motion and it's it's mechanics and it's it's energy generation and um, you know those things are are universal across uh, modalities, I guess. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's definitely things that you can learn from. Uh, from any martial system and then how much that applies to what you're trying to do kind of depends on what you're trying to do. Yeah. 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 So yeah, then around uh, 2018, I uh, decided to part ways with the school and um, there was a fun one, teaching sides fighting. <laughs> and um, pop back, you know, really seriously re-involved myself in the SCA and so went through a period of uh you know recalibrating my fight and getting that back in uh this was one of the uh collegium events okay which um is a kind of event that I will always support um I I love those events where we get to get in and teach and talk about what we do the sharing of the geek is is awesome. Yeah, I I love that picture. I love the the beer can in the foreground. Right, <laughs> super funny. Yeah, it's the almost Caravaggio shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my uh, my first Queen's Rapier Championship back. Uh... Yeah, I found out. Uh, actually did really horribly at that tournament oh. <laughs> and then got home and realized that um that I was like right on the verge of coming down with the flu oh man during that event I'm like well that explains a thing or two <laughs> uh, is this it was that cloak something that your lady did with the embellisher skill uh no this was actually so that this was my laurel cloak oh okay um, so that that was a piece that that was done for me. Oh, sweet. So, and then uh, the most recent Sport of Kings. It's a big sigh <laughs> for our last <laughs> camping event. Yeah. Aww. Aww. <laughs> oh, nice. And then the most recent collegium. And so this was a class on um, specifically on one of the elements of distressa called the atajo. Uh, a, uh, one of the general blade control techniques or not so much a technique as a, a, a blade control method that is very central to that particular system. Who is that that you're um, demoing with? Oh yeah, go ahead and ask me names. I know his name. <laughs> Am I going to remember his name? Of course not. Okay, sorry. Never mind. <laughs> words back in my mouth. That never happened. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm absolutely terrible with names. I 100% know who that is. Yeah. And I 100% cannot summon his name right now. I, I totally understand. Um, I think one of the main reasons I have kids is so that they remember names for me because they're really good at it. <laughs> I can tell you though, um, he is a lot of fun to fence. And just a minute, I think I might almost have it. <laughs> if you let it go, it'll come back to you. Yep, Michael Lancaster. Okay. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> and then, of course, this is banana suit number two. Banana suit two, son of banana suit. 
Nice. Um, and this looks like Twelfth Night. This was Twelfth Night and my accidental entry into the Twelfth Night costuming competition. Excellent. <laughs> I was sitting in the wrong room at the right time and got handed a form and told you're going to fill this out and enter. Very <laughs> cool. But yes, um, since I had built this outfit to be um, correct for period and also to pass um, rape your armor rules. Uh, they they wanted to check the mobility and make sure that I could actually do fencing actions in it. And hence the action pose. Yes. That's awesome. And then a little bit of fun um, at Ursulmus. This was the most recent Ursulmus is actually the first Ursulmus I've been able to make. Wow. In in all of this time playing. It was always one of those things where either um, I couldn't afford to do both that and Twelfth Night, mm -hmm. or I couldn't get the time off to do both that and Twelfth Night. So it was one or the other. And I, I went to Ursulmus early on in my career, and the last Ursulmus I went to was when my niece was born, and she just turned 14. Mm -hmm. uh, because both my husband and I have asthma, and we would get horribly sick after that event every year. So we just stopped going. Yes. You know, I got to say, sure. <laughs> events like this, I am going to be bringing my mask with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Ooh, and, then, and then recent project. Um, during these uh, times of plague, I've been focusing in on getting a few of the sewing projects done. Awesome. So... And, and these days I've got a little bit of a, uh, a, a focal research project on um, exercise and fitness in, in, in period That's with an idea, awesome. uh, with an eye toward whether or not that shifts any, uh, any of how we think about, you know, the way that people moved and the way that they did things physically. So that's uh, another one on the same subject. Oh, the next step in the deep dive. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's always it's it's one of those things. You you lay the groundwork and then you look for the rabbit holes. <laughs> pretty cool that you have all those places to go with it wow very cool um so that brings us to present time is there anything that we haven't covered that you wanted to talk about uh i don't know i ran, i yacked a lot <laughs> that's the whole point of this is to is to hear what your interests are to kind of understand your story a little bit and um yeah, that's good. You're supposed to yak a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. That's awesome. I totally learned a lot. Yeah, and thanks for talking about the kind of hard stuff too, because that's oh, yeah. uh, um, super informative. And I think those discussions are important to have. So Thank you. Yeah, and I mean, I'm definitely it was it was one of those interesting things when I when I made the decision to really dive back into the SCA. Um, I think one of the things that that made it a little bit easier to kind of drift away a little bit in the first place mm -hmm. was so there's there's that experience of you know being on that uh, that peerage path and you know there's I, I think I think most of us who've been on that path um, recall that point where um, you start getting a confluence of things going on where on the one hand you've got um, you've got people saying 
uh, you know, a asking that worst of all questions of, well, why don't you have such and such award yet? Like, I don't know. I'm not in that order. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then the whole, the, the, the subtle hints and nudges of, okay, you need to be at that event. Um, you, we, really make sure that you're teaching at that event. Um, you should go to this event and have a chat with that person. And, <laughs> right. And the, the basically um, that period of almost being actively led through campaigning. And it's in a lot of ways, it's not a sustainable thing. Yeah. And it takes on a life of its own and it becomes a project of its own and it becomes this thing where you it's very easy to get to the end of it and go oh well what now yeah. right and in my case it, it wasn't i mean it was one of those things where what now was okay i'm going to dig deeper into this or that or that other thing but the lengths I had to go to to dig into those things didn't necessarily lead deeper into the SCA at that time. Right. right. And so when I got to that point where I, where I was like, hey, you know what, I miss, I miss being more active in the SCA. Yeah. I had to step back and decide what that meant. Right. And I, I understand. <laughs> yeah. And, and do that, do that reevaluation and go, okay, but I'm not just coming back as Gregor, right? right. Um, I'm coming back as, you know, a peer. And so what am I bringing? You know, what am I coming back for like and what am I coming back with? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, so it, it was, it, it was one of those things where where it, it forced me to sit down and really do some evaluation of, of you know what I wanted out of things. And, yeah, for sure, for sure. And I think that that you know this forced uh, time off that we're all experiencing right now, we're all going to be doing that. Um, yeah. You know, I really hope so. Yeah. Uh, I I hope so because as much as it was an uncomfortable process to go through. Um, I think it was a very important process to come through, uh, to go through. And I feel like I'm definitely um, virtual involvement aside, <laughs> because honestly, I find virtual SCA really hard to do. Yeah. yeah um, it is. It is as, hard. Yeah. As, as somebody who is a full time remote worker anyway, um, it's, it's hard to put on my funny clothes and sit down at my work desk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. yeah but but I, i'm you know i'm i'm really enjoying being back i'm enjoying actually being more more centered in what i'm doing than than i was before and you know um so i like I said, I, I, I'm glad that I had that, that experience of going through that process. And, and, and I hope that as difficult as it is to be where we all are right now, that people are able to use that time to think about the SCA that they want to come back to yeah, I, and, I, and their role in that. I, I've noticed a lot of, um, frustration and anger coming out mm -hmm. online, uh, especially the past couple of weeks. And um, I hope that we're able to kind of work through that individually and as a group. And, and I hope that people are able to look inward a little bit and kind of take a, take a look at why they're really angry and how they can change that for themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, the SCA is what it is and there are improvements that we can make and there are, there's work that 
I think we're all trying to do towards more inclusivity. Mm -hmm. um, but there are certain foundational tenants in the SCA that um, are not going to change. And if that's part of what is not your happy place in the SCA, then I think that that needs some looking at, you know, and, and I'm not saying that people should either love the SCA as it is or go away at all. Yeah, I'm saying, you know, figure out really what it is that you're not jiving with and, and see what can and can't be changed. Well, and I think one of the other things that's happening, I, I know that that um, I, I've seen so, some other folks talk about how, you know, we've we've all collectively gone through um, a lot of trauma, <laughs> and we're we're all we're all feeling that um, we're all probably going a little stir crazy, and we're all feeling that. <laughs> And I think another thing that's happened is that as we have had to become more reliant on our online interactions than on our in-person interactions, we've started to find that in some cases there's a significant divide between how how some people choose to comport themselves in person versus how they choose to comport themselves online. And we're actively having to confront the fact that sometimes people who we thought we know, we thought we knew aren't, aren't necessarily the people that we thought we knew. And sometimes that's just a result of of stress and trauma working its way out. And sometimes it's the result of people telling us who they are. And either way, it can create a situation where it becomes hard to trust anything that anyone shows us. Yeah, yeah. And, I, uh, I think that, that the SCA is particularly mm -hmm. vulnerable to that because we have this persona yeah. that we're encouraged to develop at events and um it, 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 yeah we're asked to play a part yeah right and and it's easy to it can sometimes be easier to play that part when we're face to face than when we're not and so it also becomes really easy for us to get into a position where um, because we're having a harder time trusting each other and because we're all, um, you know, feeling what we've been through for the last, um, more than a year, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's easy to put those things together and to automatically assume that our frustration about the other person is right. And sometimes it is yeah. right, but sometimes it isn't right. And, and yeah, I, I think it, it may take us a little bit of time to get back to, you know, maybe being a little more, uh, a, a little, a little more forgiving of each other and a little more trusting of each other and a little more willing to work together and, you know, a, a little bit less defensive about each other. And yeah, you know. yeah, that's a good point. It's a good point. Because I have I, I I have felt a little defensive this week, <laughs> as a peer and as a Laurel and as an online inner um, online content provider, yeah, which totally. is weird. I I still can't wrap my head around uh, the fact that that's what I am now. But apparently, <laughs> I'm an online content provider. <laughs> well, well, if you're not, nobody is. I mean. <laughs> this is so bizarre. You know, we, yeah. we started out wanting to interview a few people and, and, and now it's, it's this, and, uh, it's been such a gift and thank you so much for hopping on board and trusting me with your story and, <laughs> and, and talking to me. I really, really appreciate it. Well, thanks for asking. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
Super excited. So um, thank you. Um, tomorrow, uh, Rifkin and I are interviewing Banyarla Dayadin, or Countess Dayadin, a uh, Lion of Ontir, um, who is just an epic personality. And I'm super excited to uh, be able to talk to her. Um, and I think on Saturday, we are interviewing um, a Laurel from Lock Ock, both of us together. And I don't remember what's going on next week. So we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> And Gregorio, thank you again so much. And thank you everybody for watching. Um, this doesn't happen without you. So I appreciate it. Good night. Thank you.